We just know her It's Baltimore Lexington Avenue at 3 p.m. I'm a waiting for the number five to roll in. I got a dollar in my pocket and it's only Wednesday. Call her Baltimore, the city of dreams Harborscapes, addicts and fiends Sugar factories and subway steam Where people embrace the craziest scenes See it's a walking contradiction of the prosaic Placed in the landscape of a mosaic of graffiti covered buildings Factories and trash Historic districts with cobblestone paths representing a full spectrum of life, a starving artist next to a to a war torn veteran, thriving middle class and a working class that struggles. People newly homeless who couldn't weather the bubble now. Will John Waters write a story about this? Artscape, Afram, Hunfest outfits. Watch it at the Hippodrome. Put your best sweater on. Camera lights flashing like an amber bright. Metronome click clack. Goes the mark train over steel tracks. Take a trip out the city. This is what'll get you back. This is where the people. At where life moves rapidly Attracted to the spirit of the inner city fantasy It's Lexington Market, 3 p.m. I'm waiting for the 22 to pull in I got a dollar in my pocket And it's only Wednesday Remington Avenue at 1 a.m. I'm waiting for the last in line to roll in I got a dollar in my pocket And it's only Wednesday Call her Baltimore, the city of dreams. Harborscapes, addicts and fiends. Sugar factories and subway steam. Where people embrace the craziest scene, you see. I'm walking down Maryland Avenue. No destination or where I'm trying to travel to. I stand still, taking in the scenery. Trying to figure out exactly what the city means to me. Gave birth to hard hats and rugged boots. Ripped jeans, white tees, sneakers and business suits. Jazz notes embedded in the pavement Rhythm of the traffic pattern is the statement of lost love Stories that's forgotten Of steel mills with metal cranes with a watchman Shipping yards, sand kids, a private school and then better Pay with scholarships to get your college life together It's a metropolis that feels like a small town All right, good afternoon, good afternoon. Welcome, welcome to TEDx Baltimore. I'm Mel Brennan, I'm one of the lead organizers for TEDx Baltimore and we really appreciate uh, you coming out here today. We really appreciate you adjusting to the last minute venue change. Um, uh, thank you for that as well. Um, I wanted to start, Ted, by telling you a very, very quick story. Um, I've been having a recurrent dream, and this recurrent dream has to do with the magic eight ball that my kids have brought out of hiding, and it stares at me, and I stare at it every time I come home at night, and I kept wondering, should I pick that up and ask it about this, Ted? Should I take that chance? Uh, and last night, I picked up that eight ball, and I asked it the question, will we have a successful TEDx Baltimore? And I shook it, and I turned it over. And it said, you will have to wait and see. <laughs> no help whatsoever. Um, but the waiting is over, 
and we are here to enjoy ideas worth spreading in what is uh, the inaugural TEDx Baltimore. So without further ado, let me introduce our host for this afternoon, sessions one and two in this event, Anthony McCarthy. Your program talks about Anthony's background in journalism. Um, you know that he is the host of the Anthony McCarthy Show on WEAA. Um, you know that he is the 2000 and 2003 40 under 40 list for Baltimore Business Journal. You may not know that he is also an ordained minister. So he will be very comfortable up here sharing with all of you. I'm very excited to have each and every one of you. Welcome to TEDx Baltimore. And now Anthony McCarthy. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Come on, we can do better than that. We need lots of energy. Good afternoon. Okay, that was a little too much. Okay, that was good. This is an exciting day. You're in for such an incredible treat. Now, Mel told you a story, so let me tell you a real quick story. On my show, we talk politics a lot. I love politics. But I also love that human-to-human -human interaction. There's a story that's told about a set of twins that were born. And they were born early, as twins often are. One of the twins was doing really well. But the other twin was having some serious, serious problems. And they were having difficulty making sure that the sick twin was incubated, that it was getting better. And one of the nurses in the hospital decided she would break the rules, which is what we're going to do today a lot, break the rules. And she would put the healthy baby in the incubator with its sick twin. And as she did that, the healthy twin wrapped its arm around its sick sister. And within minutes, her heartbeat became normal. She started to breathe on her own. And I share that story because in the city of Baltimore, in our metropolitan area, one of the things we forget so often is that we need each other. That we really can create a city, create a state, create a country that we want if we do it together. Put our differences aside, acknowledge them, but invest in each other to make sure that we're creating the world that our children will inherit and that we all can be proud of. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to change the world, and we start with you. Our first speaker is Talam, Talam AC. Now, Talam is arguably the most profound and prolific spoken word artist of the last decade. He um, is a child of the Newark Rebellion, and um, where his mother, he was raised by a single mother, was part of the writer activist Amiri Baraka's co uh, community organization. Now, I would encourage you when you get home, if you go to YouTube, to search his name and watch one or two or three or four of his videos. He's going to make you mad, he's going to inspire you, he's going to prick your conscience, and he's going to give you hope. So without further ado, our first speaker, Talam AC. Clicker. Hello there. I didn't know that the host was a preacher. We've been uh, talking backstage. Hopefully uh, he'll not be too upset by some of my ideas. <laughs> if there is a heaven, I hope they hold a special place for people like me. Not hot, but you know, just a little warmer. Where I'm not forced to sing the same songs over and over again a million times. Where I'm not expected to listen to people give long sermons that are not profound. We are, I don't have to hear hypocrites tell me not to do the same things that they do themselves. Where I don't have to re-meet everyone I've already met on earth like some high school reunion that never ends. We are, I don't have to talk to beings with giant wings and act like I think that's cool or fashion forward. And since we're on the subject, I don't know how I feel about halos because I've always felt that light should shine from the inside out. So if there is a heaven, I hope they hold a special place for people like me. Not hot, but you know, just a little warmer. Where 
I'm not expected to float around aimlessly like I had some type of frontal lobotomy. Where I'm not expected to smile and laugh all day like I'm trying to OD on magic mushrooms. Where my entire existence isn't planned out like when to talk, when to sleep, when to pray, like I'm sentenced to some eternal penitentiary. I just want to be free. And I've always been confused because if God made us individuals, then how does what constitute heaven for me also constitute what's heaven for you? I mean, you might want to fly around and play a harp and things or explore the, <laughs> explore the countryside, meet new souls and play games. But me, I just want my aura to increase. And when I return to the essence, I want to rest in peace. So if there is a heaven, I hope there's a special place for people like me. Not hot, but you know just a little warmer. Because when it's over, what I want most is that sweet release. And what I want most for you is just an eternity of whatever you would consider to be peace. Thank you. So my name is Talam AC. I'm a spoken word artist. I want to do more, though, than poetry. I want to tell you some of the things that go through in my mind, some of the things that I've been taught over the years. Um, I entitled it The Future We Make for Ourselves because the theme was the future we make, so I was trying to be, like, half creative. <laughs> <laughs> I should have asked him how this worked, huh? In order to tell you about myself, I have to tell you that I've had two trajectories in life. I um, have an MBA in finance, have an, uh, a BS in accounting. I used to teach at Rutgers University. I taught at Rutgers, at Rutgers University so shortly after my MBA that some of the people I was teaching were people I used to study with. I um, worked for the Small Business Development Center, which was an affiliate of the SBA. I used to go around and give lectures about business planning and help people get loans and things like that. Uh, but I never really had a real, real job in my life. Does that make any sense? No, it doesn't, right? <laughs> and uh, I was offered all kinds of things. I was the type of kid in school, in college, I mean, that I would uh, go around to the bursar, to the registrar, to the financial aid office and just hang out. I would bring boxes of donuts so that, you know, in case there was a problem, things would go my way, right? <laughs> I, uh, before I got into school for the MBA, I started volunteering in the office where they help you get jobs because I thought that would be the smartest thing that I could do. And the funny thing is when I finished, I never applied for a job. <laughs> so that's one trajectory. The other trajectory is after all of those things, I became a, a consultant and so on and so forth and I got bored. So I actually just changed trajectories, and I decided what I was going to do is spoken word full time. The first time I saw somebody do spoken word, I, I just couldn't take it. Like, I went in by mistake, in a way, because it was the last thing I ever wanted to hear. I just thought it would be boring and people would, you know. But it wasn't what I expected. So when I first saw the first people doing it, I knew I had to do it so much so that I couldn't even stay there for like 10 minutes. I went out to my car and started trying to work on my own stuff. First day, okay? Um, so now, I've been doing spoken word full time for about 12 years. I travel more than I would like to. I take about 100 flights a year. So on average, every three and a half days, I'm on a plane. I've been, in the last two weeks, we were talking about this back there, I was in uh, London, Austria, back to Baltimore, then to Los Angeles, and then back to Baltimore again. And I promise you, if you know anything about souls and traveling, some of my soul, I'm sure, is still in Austria, and I'm waiting to get it back, okay? <laughs> so that's that. My favorite quote is by an economist named J.K. Galbraith. Anyone familiar with him? Okay. He worked, worked for uh, FDR. He worked for uh, Kennedy, for Johnson. But this is one of my favorite quotes, if not my favorite quote, which is, there are you know, pretty much two types of people, those who don't know and those who don't know that they don't know. And I'm proud to admit I'm the first type. I'm sure that I just don't know. So when I'm saying things to you, I want you to take it from the aspect of somebody who's just exploring thoughts. I'm not saying that this is what's definitely happening. 
I'm just saying it's possible. Cool? <laughs> this quote reminds me of another quote, which was written much earlier uh, by a gentleman named Socrates, who at least everyone agrees existed because Plato, they just you know, go back and forth as to whether he ever existed. Have you heard of that? Have you heard people talk about that? People, there are people who think that Plato never existed. <laughs> who knows? I wasn't there. That's what I was trying to tell you. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> then there's an earlier quote than this, which is, man, woman, know thyself. And I thought it was like a pressure quote. Like I thought, I felt this tremendous pressure that I needed to know myself. And then it dawned on me that it's not really something that was possible, it's just a pursuit. You follow? It's something that you work towards. You continuously try to know yourself and explore. And in knowing myself and in attempting to know myself, what I try to do is think outside the box. Wow, what a cliche. Did I say that? <laughs> so, try. I don't believe in hell, but we could sell it. I said, I do not believe in hell, but we could sell it. I mean, tell them we're the anointed agents of salvation. Sinners, the only way to be forgiven is if you're living within a system of precepts and suppositions that we prescribe. Tell them a book that was assembled by the Nazi Council from a hodgepodge of religious texts was literally written by God. Think for yourself and burn in hell. Infernal blazes, ignites hair, singes bone, melts faces into the faceless. We alone determine what faith is. Heaven may or may not exist, but they need to believe. We hold the keys to eternal peace. Christ said, the only way to the Father is through me, and the only way to Christ is through us. Plus, tell him there's a demon powerful enough to the Father, almighty creator. And we're the ordained soul negotiators, and they will pay us to save them from hell which I don't believe in, but we could sell it. I mean, they're already scared. They're already living amongst violence, disease, decadence, and fear. They're already living amongst rank smells, garbage, ghetto slums. Tell them this is hell on earth and the key to our influences and convince them that, that their afterlife can be even worse. I mean, it's the oldest game in the world, so we might as well keep saying it. Just like the Egyptian god, amen, ain't got nothing to do with Christianity, but it works, so we keep saying it. Just like the Old Testament has about as much to do with the new as it has to do with the Quran, as it has to do with hellish wars like the Crusades and the conflict in Vietnam, tell them God commanded tyrants to destroy entire societies and leave no man, woman, or child behind. Don't allow them to know that God is love. Tell them God is vindictive and jealous. Tell them God ain't for the peaceful and the tolerant. God is for the superficial self-righteous zealots in which the simple and judgmental are relished. Oh, I do not believe in hell, gentlemen but I promise you, we could sell it. <laughs> this is another of my favorite quotes. It says, it's amazing what you can accomplish if you do not care who gets the credit. And I never knew who wrote the quote until I started researching it, because I wanted to tell y'all, but I didn't want to take credit for it. So I just, <laughs> and um, it reminds me of a, a story when they were trying to explain to us in business school what an entrepreneur was. And they said, an entrepreneur is someone who finds a prospective employee, takes them to a cliff, points down at a random uh, palace, chalet, mansion, estate, and says, look at the cars, look at the swimming pool, the tennis courts, if you come and work for me, all of that and more will be mine. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, Sam is uh, a formula that I try to live by. Sam is where S stands for success. The A stands for, anyone? Y'all can talk, right, today? Aptitude, right? So the A stands for what it is that you are skilled at, what you can do, what your gift is. But it's the M that seems to be the most important part of the formula, which is motivation. So S equals A times M. 
So success e equals aptitude times motivation. And my mother was always telling me when I was younger about people who had all of this aptitude and this incredible gift, but did nothing with it. And it's nothing worse than to have a gift and find yourself doing something that you feel is beneath you. That's why all of those people are mad at you when you're in the market or at the toll booth and they feel like, you know, damn it, I should have just got that PhD. <laughs> this is another thing. Uh, obviously that's money, that's happiness, and you, you follow the grid, right? On the, top, <laughs> on the top, that means you got a lot of money. On the side, that means you're really happy, right? So the question is, if you could be in any of these spaces, which would you be? And the answer, invariably, everybody says that, you know, they know they don't want to be there. They don't want to be broke and unhappy. <laughs> everybody pretty much wants to be there, which is they want to be happy and have money, right? So the next question is, if you couldn't be one of those things, if you couldn't be number one, and you don't want to be number four, where would you go? Would you be happy and not have money, or would you have money and not be happy? Happy and have money? <laughs> so you'd be happy and have no money. That seems to be the trajectory. And the reason why is because it seems that as long as you're doing something you love, success seems to follow. Cool? Good. I'm doing great on time. <laughs> I wanted to talk to you a little bit about depression also. I've known a lot of people, and, and it's a weird way to end the talk, but I've known a lot of people who have crossed over and to the other side by their own hands. Um, uh, starting with a high school girlfriend uh, and then a kid that was a resident of mine when I was a residence counselor in college, but after I left. And uh, most recently, a motivational speaker, which is ironic because you know, motivational speakers shouldn't kill themselves. That's Jersey humor, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to present this to her. I used to say this poem when I was married to my daughter's mother and I was suicidal. Not that the two things go together, but I'm just saying. <laughs> you put it together how you want. <laughs> Who made this world? Where my wife's man and her husband are not one and the same? Where poets are extremely talented and some of them vain? Act like they'd be willing to bust one in your brain, especially when they start gunning for name. I swear, the more things change, the further I go insane. I'm shell-shocked. I ain't no good for no woman no more. Perhaps I should just barricade myself and hear what my daughters It don't seem correct to subject some innocent woman to my marriage-induced post-traumatic stress disorder. Sometimes I think this living room couch is going to become my from here on out living quarters. And that eventually, after continuously waking up here, my eyes are just going to well up with water. I mean, a lesser man would just do it. But I would rather be crucified than commit suicide. And any hustler, whether they be dead or alive, would recognize that the look in my eyes is strictly do or die. Besides, people that commit suicide must not believe in God. Otherwise, they would understand that there's a rhyme and reasons why this life gets so hard. And they would put their nose to the grindstone and get used to the taste of their own blood. Because life is a monster of a mobster. And you got to get your, chop up, you got to get your chops up which to associate with that known thug. This world is like the Wizard of Oz. And until you show some heart, you don't never get shown no love. So when you're feeling desperate, think you done gave all you got to give, and you ask yourself, who made this world? The answer is simple. You and your actions did. And if you don't like the way that the life you live is changing, then isn't it just as obvious that you must live your life to change the way you live? Happiness is mathematic. That's all it is. Happiness is mathematic. That's all it is. Happiness is mathematic, y'all. That's all. So I want to close out by telling you a, a story, a quick one, a parable that I learned when I was younger. It's about an older gentleman, a sage, who would just sit on a rocking chair and, you know, the older adults would come uh, to his porch and ask him questions and he always had the right answer. And sometimes the children would come and ask him questions and he always had the right answer. 
So one day a group of kids got irritated by it. They were upset. They wanted to fix it. They wanted to come and ask him a question he couldn't possibly answer. So they came up with a plan where they would take, the bir take a bird, come to the man's house, stand in front of him with the bird behind one of their backs. And sadly, they were going to ask the man, is the bird alive or dead? If the man said the bird was alive, they were going to kill it and show him that it was indeed dead. If he said it was dead, they were going to open up their hands and let the bird fly away to prove that he was wrong. And when they asked the question, the old man just sat there and laughed. And when he finished, finally, frustrating them even more, he says, the answer to your question is simple because the answer to your question is in your hands. And just like those children, the future is in your hands. Oh, I'm sorry, that's my hand. Wait, the future is in your hands. <laughs>
that you'll ever meet. Would you please welcome Tom Loveland. Hi there. The most incredible person you'll ever meet, one of. Yeah, wow. right. Woo! <laughs> well, so here we go. I'm um, going to talk to you about Baltimore's fiber future. And uh, I am Tom Loveland, CEO of Mind Over Machines. And in addition to being Baltimore's Google czar, I also get to be a co-chair of Baltimore's broadband task force. A couple of years ago, Congress asked the FCC to come up with a national broadband plan. Google made some particular suggestions, and internally, Google considered uh, suggesting that the federal government help actually wire some communities. When Sergey Brin heard this part of the idea, he said, you know, that's not really the government's place. Why don't we do that? And so the idea for Google Fiber was born. Uh, many months later, uh, Google's then CEO, uh, issued an op-ed in the Washington Post where he was decrying the uh, nation's innovation, uh, um, what's the word he's using here? Deficit. And he had a bunch of suggestions. And one of those, idea number four, included making broadband much more widely available across the nation. So that was on a, when, Tuesday, that was on a Tuesday, the very next day. What a coincidence. Google Fiber for Communities was announced. Uh, this was an opportunity for one or more towns in this nation to uh, have Google install for free um, one gigabit fiber, which is about 100, 200 times faster than what most of us use today. And at the time, uh, we were thinking that they might install it in two, three, four communities. We weren't really sure. Uh, the nation got excited. Mayors jumped into shark tanks and uh, frozen rivers. Uh, citizens marched in formation around the towns. Everybody got into the game and had a lot of fun. Google Fiber was the talk of Baltimore for a good few weeks. Um, you know, boardrooms, dining room tables, restaurants. All right. And um, everybody was thinking about what life could be like if we had ultra high speed access at really fast speed, the things that we could do. And we came up with a whole bunch of really neat ideas, people in this room and, and around. Uh, imagine, for instance, uh, under Armour executives not traveling to China to look at the latest prototypes, but actually looking at them here in Baltimore on a really high resolution 3D holograph. I recognize this isn't a shoe, um, but I couldn't, you know, that's what I could come up with. Um, and then they might have, actually have dinner in a restaurant here instead of spending money in China. Um, imagine if the uh, Space Telescope Science Institute collaborated with Maryland Science Center. We could uh, uh, Offer, we could you know, astound and educate our children with an interactive, immersive, three-dimensional walk-through experience, a model of the universe. Imagine, well, already Baltimore is a home for leader, uh, is a leader in, in serious games. Uh, we're we're uh, teaching uh, military folks, what to, uh, running simulations for them in the field, um, uh, emergency room hospitals, uh, homeland security simulations, all this stuff happens already. Imagine how much better those could be with the kind of speeds that, you know, 100, 200 times faster connectivity would allow. You could have, you know, immersive experiences with people from all over the community and learning even better than they do today. Imagine musicians and songwriters collaborating uh, in studios across town or across the globe. Imagine our medical experts viewing streaming three-dimensional images of, uh, uh, around as well so they could actually diagnose patients and, uh, and educate other providers around the globe. Imagine them actually doing surgery on those patients on other parts of the planet. Imagine doctors simply providing better care to our own residents here in Baltimore. At uh, Kennedy, many students, uh, many patients of Kennedy Krieger, many of the young patients actually benefit from having a lot of interaction with the doctors. It'd be really nice if the doctors could see some of these patients three, you know, three four, five times a week or, or more for just a few minutes and adjust treatment plans. And it, there's a huge difference if they're able to do that versus seeing them maybe once a week, or it's even hard for some of these, these patients to get to the doctor's office once every two weeks. And it's a huge difference in outcomes uh, for these patients. It's even cheaper for Kennedy Krieger to actually put PCs with cameras in these patients' homes. They would like to do that, but much better outcomes. It's cheaper, but they don't have broadband, so they can't do it. Baltimore can be the health IT capital of the world. We have amazing assets here. We have 
uh, two huge research parks. We're home to many federal agencies that are focused on healthcare. This city houses some of the most significant and comprehensive medical databases in the world. Imagine if we could connect them with this ultra high speed fiber. <clears throat> you could be like Tom Cruise in Minority Report, except you'd actually be walking through your data, recognizing patterns and, uh, 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 and just opportunities that, that you never have noticed before that you couldn't see the way we have to interact with our data today. Imagine if we all had our PCs hooked up in this town you know, to, with ultra high speed fiber. We could just leave it on and the city could operate as a supercomputer at night, solving all kinds of problems. Imagine the entrepreneurs, how much fun they would have. Lafayette, Louisiana wired their city a, a couple of years ago. And Pixel Magic, one of the major 3D uh, studios in Hollywood, opened a branch in Lafayette and bringing over 100 employees. We told all these ideas, we shared them all with Google, Fi with Google, and we told them that if you bring Google Fiber here, we won't just sit in our duffs and watch movies, you know, really downloading them every five minutes, but we will actually help you change the world. And we submitted our nomination online, and then I was about two steps out of the mayor's office, and it hit me, oh wow, Google might actually come here for a site visit. We need to get our act in order so we know what to show them and can help make sure they pick Baltimore. And then two steps after that, it hit me, they might never come. Look at the map. 1,100 communities responded to Google. At the time, again, we thought they might pick maybe three communities or so. Those aren't good odds. So we kicked off what I call Plan B, taking responsibility for our own fiber future. We held a symposium. Everybody came to the symposium. Um, government officials, legislators, politicians, I'm stuck on that, uh, businesses, uh, Verizon, Comcast, uh, foundations, uh, citizens, entrepreneurs, um, the FCC, and uh, we had some of the leading thinkers and, and doers in broadband from around the country actually remotely involved in our, in our conference. And then we kicked off the broadband task force to study these questions. You know, what do we really have and what can we accomplish? What are the best practices out there? And we're working on this and we're finding out it's not hard. I mean, it's not easy. It's a pretty hard thing to do. But we were then gifted in September, I think it was, with a fabulous gift. Baltimore received the third largest federal package stimulus money to uh, implement broadband of any place in the nation. And this is really, really big news. <laughs> One Maryland will connect 1,000 institutions across the state, connecting every county in the state. Maryland is the first state in the nation that will be completely connected with 10 gigabit fiber. That's 10 times faster than Google's one gigabit fiber. This is amazing, but One Maryland Broadband is not Google Fiber. Google Fiber is coming to every home and business pretty much in Kansas City, Kansas, and it could have been the same thing here and still could possibly come here in the future. One Maryland Broadband is coming to a thousand institutions across the nation. It's not coming to your home or to your business anytime soon. And so we still have this big challenge of how do we get from here, but it's a wonderful gift, but how do we get from here to this vision that we've been talking about? And again, it's not easy, but we're working on it with City Hall and, and foundations and so forth. So our vision is that three years from now, we would like to be able to say that um, Baltimore's children and families are connected as never before our businesses, our entrepreneurs are just having a ball. Um, our health and, and welfare outcomes are, are on the rise. The digital divide is decreasing every single day. And um, we'd really like to be able to say that Baltimore's broadband future has actually arrived. It's burning bright. We'd like to have your help to make that happen. And thank you for your time today. Wasn't he everything I built him up to be? Our next speaker is Mike Sabelski. Mike is a Baltimore-based entrepreneur and technologist, a big believer in Baltimore's innovation community of artists, technologists, thinkers, and strivers of all type. And that belief has led him to start a lot of incredible activities that are making a difference in our city. Would you please welcome Mike Sabelski? Mike. Thank you. Wow. 
Wow, thank you very much. Uh, it's really awesome here to be tonight. When I agreed to do this, uh, following Tom Loveland uh, was not, uh, not part of the, the deal. It's uh, big shoes to fill, but I'll see what I can do. This picture was taken at Startup Weekend Baltimore uh, a couple weeks ago. This is an event that Mike Brenner organized along with a lot of other people who are here today. Uh, teams of people came together uh, to create new companies, new products that they demonstrated on, on Sunday night. Very exciting event, had a lot of buzz. I want to see this happening on a daily basis, people forming new companies and making new products on a much greater scale than it's happening in Baltimore uh, today. Uh, and, that, and that's what my talk is all about. Uh, we, to, the future of Baltimore is putting people back to work, making things and inventing things. But uh, who's really talking about that? Uh, most of the public conversation, as far as I can tell, is projects uh, like adding a zip line to the Inner Harbor or the Grand Prix. <laughs> or building the ICC. There are these uh, big, often tourism-directed projects that involve a lot of energy and money and time that are one-offs. You're making a huge bet, and you're playing a zero-sum game with other states. There's only so many tourism dollars. There's, so many, there's only so many people you can fleece with gambling, et cetera. Um, I'm talking about, I, I'm saying, let's, I have 1650 left, folks. OK, uh, but thank you. I'm saying let's shave off just a sliver of the money and the attention that's going to this stuff and let's make a, a thousand small bets. I'm going to pre present to you ten or so small bets. Whether you like my ideas or not, it's unimportant. The, the, there's, each of us could come up with ten of their own pet projects. I'm, I'm guaranteeing you that would have a much more transformative effect on the economy. So, the summer of code. Let's give stipends to Baltimore area, Mar Maryland area uh, students, uh, uh, high school, undergraduate, graduate. Let's give them a $5,000 stipend to cover, cover their living expenses for one summer, based on the Google Summer of Code and Ruby Summer of Code ideas. Uh, all they have to do is work on open source software or do something with a civic purpose, like work with uh, Baltimore's open transparency data, create new tools for policy leaders and journalism uh, people and the like. Uh, let's have entrepreneur office hours. The, I have news for you. I talk to a lot of new entrepreneurs that want me to work with them, uh, uh, want, want help finding technologists to work on their company. The main thing that's stopping people from starting companies in this area is not a lack of money. It's really just a lack of know-how, a lack of connections. So why don't we just as a community decide that like, oh, the first Monday of every month, for, or, of every Monday from 4 to 6 p.m. at the Emerging Technology Center or somewhere else in the city, you can meet with someone who's experienced in one of these areas. That way, you're never more than one month away from being able to make a connection with somebody who can help you get your idea off the ground. More importantly, they could probably steer you in a, a, in a better direction, maybe help you not start that bad idea and get going on a new idea. <laughs> but here's the question. If you volunteered right now, all right, I'm gonna, I'll be there on the third uh, Monday of November, who's going to send you an email at the beginning of November reminding you that back here at TEDx, you volunteered to do that? Well. Uh, some Baltimore organization needs to sponsor a staff person called the Innovation Community Manager to provide staff support and logistics to events and programs like TEDx Baltimore, and, and like the one I just described. I don't know why we, the venue changed, but I can well imagine, because I've organized a bunch of things like this, and I know all the headaches that you have when you're dealing with venues. I, not, you know, the, just, it, it's just part of the territory. There's just some logistical friction there. Uh, what if there was somebody whose whole job was to negotiate deals with venues, to hold bank accounts, uh, to go out and get media sponsorships, to go get corporate sponsorships? Then somebody like Mel Brennan could just focus on the content and finding the best, awesomest speakers and putting on the awesomest event possible. All right. Uh, I just I want to say more. I've got to keep going. All right. Secret Science Club. This is something in New York that I want to import to Baltimore. Uh, let's get public intellectuals, people who are subject matter experts, somebody like Will Knoll at the Walters. Let's put them on stage and treat them like rock stars and talk about technically complex things and make them really exciting and accessible. There's a real hunger for stuff like this. You guys are all here because you're the kind of people that would love to go to this. This would be a very low cost way for somebody like Hopkins to engage more fully with, with civic society here. A new repertory theater. There's like four or five movie theaters in Baltimore. There's room for way more. At Ignite Baltimore, the director, Matt Porterfield, explained this idea of uh, like reviving something like the Orpheum Theater, where on Saturday morning, you could take your kids there to see old-fashioned cartoons. Saturday night, you could go back for a date night. You could see some, an art house film. You could see some kind of indie thing that was made in Baltimore. You could see a movie from 50 years ago. This could be really successful. I really have a vision in my mind of how, the, how this could make a lot of money and be, for, and be good for the whole for culture. All right, 
We do have some blogs in Baltimore that cover technology. Startup Baltimore has a, a narrow focus, and Balt Tech, which is the Baltimore Sun blog, has a very broad focus. I want to see something like Technically Philly, uh, which is a blog that covers everything to do with technology in Philadelphia. So look, for this podcast, I want there to be one week they interview a, an iPhone developer, an independent person that's, that's able to support uh, themselves just through selling at things in the App Store. The next week, I want them to interview the CIO of Leg Mason. And the next week, I want them to interview Tom Lovin, et cetera, et cetera. I would love to host this. I just need somebody else to kind of ha help me get it running. I need, I need an executive producer. OK. And, or somebody else host it, and then I won't have to. Uh, another idea from Philly and also from DC's Digital Capital Week, we need to have Baltimore Technology Week. If we have a beer week and a restaurant week, we can certainly have a technology week. <laughs> Uh, and, and also, we could have an art week. You know, we have so many cool events like TEDx Baltimore. Uh, why don't we have one week where we cram them all into one week, and it, you know, we run ourselves ragged going to so many cool things. And the reason why you do that is because it puts a big spotlight on the community, all the positive things that innovators in Baltimore here are doing. It'd be easy to get media coverage, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And every new media article that comes out brings someone else out of the woodwork into our fold. OK, Amateur Porn Festival. Stick with me. This is, we're going somewhere with this. This is something happening in Seattle, the Hump Festival in Seattle. I read about it in Dan Savage's blog. Now, I've never seen a pornographic film. I know none of you guys ever have. <laughs> but I'm told, I read, that it's a very big industry ripe for disruption. I've heard that it offers a lot of the same content over and over again without any, there's not a lot of innovation going on is what I gather. So. Um, the reason why this is worth doing, it's not because you're going to get some kind of erotic charge by going to this festival. I, you, I, I hope, maybe you will. Um, but I think it would be super fun to see what people come up with in each category. And I don't think there's any other city on the East Coast where this would get as much oxygen to grow and breathe as it would here in Baltimore. Uh, that, like, let's, let's play up our, our quirkiness and our, our, our awesomeness. This would be a signpost in the ground saying that Baltimore is a place where unbridled creativity really could take root, and no one's going to stop you. We're, we're going to make our own porn film. Awesome. OK. Uh, Artomatic is an event that happens in DC where they take over a building that's uh, not occupied, but it's inhabitable. Maybe it's not quite finished or, or, or held up with red tape or whatever. And they turn it into an art gallery performance space for two weeks. Think of the current gallery downtown. Imagine if you blew up the current gallery into a whole building and you made it last only two weeks. This would be a major happening for the art scene and for culture in Baltimore. OK. Uh, we need to have an awards night. Uh, you think about the people, like think about Mike Brenner, who put up the Startup Weekend. Think about uh, Mel Brennan. Uh, think about Nate Mook. Think about Heather Sarkissian, Scott Burkholder, a million other people. That I, I'm sorry, I, those are just the ones off the top of my head. These people are not doing all the volunteer things that they do for extrinsic rewards, but we need to thank them anyway. Uh, something that I learned when I was in the Navy uh, was that just a little bit of official recognition. Like you literally just give someone a plaque that says, you donated the awesomest website for a project over the past year. That goes so far to refueling someone's tank so that they'll be that much more willing to volunteer their gifts next time. And it needs to be something that's for us and by us, not from some top-down institution. OK, uh, this is an unformed idea, but I, I was reviewing applications for a, a startup accelerator where people are seeking $15,000 of angel investment. And a lot of the ideas, some of the ideas, were good business ideas that I thought would make money. But I didn't think that an investor would want to invest in them because they're not going to generate 10x returns. But those businesses should get started. And what it made me think is that since banks have conglomerated and turned themselves into socially useless organizations making CDOs and constructing Dutch sandwiches, and et cetera. Um, like now there's actually a niche. There's a room for, for, for a new kind, like, a, like a, to revive the idea of a loan officer, somebody that comes to things like this event and knows people and knows who's a good credit risk to help get these small scale businesses going. Because that, of course, is the majority of business activity is small business activity. All right. Uh, uh, Flashpoint, this is another idea I love from DC. Uh, you get a bunch of different arts organizations, small scale arts organizations that on their own can't afford their own space. You have them pool their resources, each pays a reasonable amount of rent per month, and each of them gets a guaranteed amount of use of that black box space of that gallery. Uh, and you, 
the, the place in, in DC, I, I watched it help Washington Improv Theater go from being a, a small struggling organization to one that's a real professional theater that employs people and has people on salary and, and is doing work, groundbreaking work in improv theater. We have a lot of groups in Baltimore that are like right in the middle. They're dance collectives and theater troops that aren't community theater exactly, but they're not center stage either. And this is how you get them to that next level. Okay, Software Institute of Baltimore. This is one of my favorite ideas. I saved, I saved it for last. Uh, something really exciting has, is happening in the world of software. Uh, in the past 10 years, programming tools have become so powerful, so abstract, that when you write code now, especially if you're writing something like a web application or an iPhone app or an Android app, something like that, what you're doing includes computer science and it includes software engineering, but it also has an aspect that, to me, the programmer feels like a fine art. It feels like some kind of performance. And there's a growing group of people who have that feeling. They call themselves software craftsmen. They have a manifesto. They have a conference. But they don't really have an academic institution. So here's the idea. Let's just make Baltimore the world center of excellence for this idea by establishing an academic center of excellence. In fact, uh, if anyone with a, oh, right. So uh, that's the kind of stuff that I, it would teach as an example that doesn't really fall under the rubric of computer science. These, these designy things, these things that have to do with making a finished product, not just a really efficient algorithm or a low level device driver. So in fact, why don't we just have the something or other school of software at, the, at, at MICA where they teach software creativity, where, they where it's, there's programmers who want to be better designers and there's designers who want to be better programmers and there's people who want to do both. Uh, this is laid out in great detail, the whole curriculum at that link below, which I also posted on my blog. You should definitely check it out. So if anyone here has a MICA connection, like, let's put a bug in their ear because this would crush. It would make so much money for the school. It would be such a good thing for the city. I can't believe we don't already have this. All right. So I just laid out for you some of the things that I, they're, they're, some of those are very small. It would cost you almost no money to get Secret Science Society going. It would cost a lot more money to create a new school at MICA. But all those things cumulatively, cumulatively taken together costs a lot less than the, the big ICC scale projects that, that we're used to. I mean, it, like this is, this is the status quo right now. None of these things, while being, I'm sure they're worthy in their own right, and I know a lot of good people have worked on them, none of these things is really going to transform the economy. This is just more of the same. I firmly believe that if you do stuff like what I outlined, not, maybe not those things, but stuff like that, you can uh, cause a tremendous effect. Some of those programs are going to end up blowing up and creating a huge dividend. Uh, other ones may fizzle out, but the cumulative effect is going to be very great. I left out a lot of my, my favorite, a lot of my ideas. I'd love to talk with you more, answer your questions, find out what, what your ideas are. If you want to get in touch with me, that's my Twitter address. That's my email. Thank you very much. Thanks. Tech, tech rock stars, tech rock stars. I never think of these guys as rock stars, but in their world, I'm sure that they are rock stars. There's a tech rock star, and I'm not supposed to do this, but I'm going to break the rules. Mario Armstrong is here. If you do not listen to him on YPR, if you don't listen to his radio show, that's a tech rock star right there. Welcome, Mario. Now, our next speaker is an educator. She told me that a very interesting story in the green room, which is yellow, but the green room in the back, she said she loves her kids. She's so proud of her kids. And the world is changing so much for our children. And the opportunities for our children are really uh, amazing. And she said that her husband, who's, a, you know, your average kind of business guy, came home and said he was in the office with one of his colleagues who has a seven-year-old son. And one day he was with his son, he was reading the newspaper, the little seven-year-old was eating his cereal, and with all the sincerity in the world, the seven-year-old looked up at his dad, and he said, Dad, and he looked at him, and his son looked so serious. Dad, can a white guy be president of the United States? A seven-year-old. So he is just becoming aware of the opportunities and possibilities. He obviously didn't know the guy that is before the current president ultimate white guy. But anyway, <laughs> no politics, no politics. Bobby McDonald is the executive director and founder of the City Neighbors Foundation. They have three incredible um, schools here in the city. They are a project-based learning schools that art integration and um, parent involvement are foundations of the work that they do. 
they have a program that if the parents aren't involved, the parents get involved really quickly. They believe children learn better when their parents are partners in their education. The parents run the schools, not the company, not the, I love teachers, but not the teachers or principal. The parents run their children's school. Would you welcome Bobby McDonald? Thank you. Um, I missed a great opportunity when I was young. Every summer I played softball, and for your information, I played left field and third base because I had a pretty good arm. All right. <laughs> and um, right near the end of the school year, the head of the park district, and I lived in a small town um, south of Chicago, the head of the park district came up to me and said, hey, Bobby, um, you know, people knew I was a singer because I sang everywhere I went, night, night till uh, every day. Um, we'd like you to sing the Star Spangled Banner at opening day this year. And I said, cool, all right, you know, and I rode away on my cool bike, and I didn't mention it to my mom, and I certainly didn't write it down on a calendar. Um, but then opening day came, and I actually did, did realize it was opening day. And I thought of that, wasn't I supposed to do something, something about singing? And nothing came to mind, really, and I thought, well, they'll be fine without me. I'm sure they'll sing the song without me. No big deal. And I kept doing whatever it was I was involved in and didn't actually go to opening day that year. And then a few days later at my first softball game, I rode to the field on my bike and I got off. And everywhere I went, people said, where were you? We needed you. We wanted to sing the Star Spangled Banner and you were nowhere to be found. You know, we called out to you with the mic. Is Bobby here? And I was so surprised and ashamed. And I also thought, oh, God, when my ma hears this. <laughs> But I've always regretted that, and I thought they would carry on without me, and I guess they didn't. And so when my phone rang back in 2003, and a friend said, hey, Bobby, someone just passed the charter school law. Marilyn just passed it. Why don't you open a school? You've been searching for a school for your daughter, Sadie, and your two children. This could be it. You could do it. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm, I'm a very busy woman. I'm working on a quilt. Not even done with it yet. <laughs> <laughs> right. I have three young children under the age of six, so that means I'm at some level certifiably insane. And, um, you know, I just, why don't you research that idea, a public charter school? I'm not even sure, you know, and I pushed my good friend off the phone. And that night, my husband Rob and I put our kids in bed, and I sang for the millionth time Thunder Road to my son Ramsey, who insists on the full version every night. Um, <laughs> And I stayed up late, and I did finish that quilt. And when I woke up in the morning, I thought, yes, this is it. This is my chance. This time, it is going to matter who I am. Because back then, I didn't think it mattered who I was. I didn't think it mattered that I didn't show up. But this time, I can have it so that my voice is heard. This time, because I have strong feelings about what makes a great school, I could get together with the parents and teachers and children of Baltimore City and come up with some way to make the best school we could imagine. And so we started with this question, if you could have the best school you could imagine, what would it be? And the beauty of it is, is that you actually make answering this question the work of the school. And to do that, you need to be listening to children, you need to be listening to parents, and the teachers have to be generating curriculum, and the parents have to be generating everything that it takes to run a fabulous school. And I do want to say the good news, which is that we actually have everything we need right here. So this is one of my favorite pictures, because um, Jacques and Kai are simply out on the playground at recess at City Neighbors Charter School, our first op school that we opened in 2005. These boys have grabbed a book. They're outside reading. Um, Jacques, the younger one, is showing something to Kai. There's no coercion going on here for learning. This is just a joyful moment for them in a very relaxed way, isn't it? I, I want to help you, um, whatever you picture with public education in Baltimore City, I just want you to relax about that and let it expand to all the possibilities. So these boys are out there playing on the playground and um, looking at this book. So at the heart of our school, we had to have a vision of the student as capable and complex and worthy of study. 
And no matter if that child came to us in kindergarten having been read to for 4,000 hours or 40, they still have that deep human need to be understood, to be loved, and to express themselves with the greatest of joy and creativity. So how do you involve students in, in this kind of learning? You have to let them know that you actually value their thinking. So I, of course I want to douse you with these amazing projects, long-term inquiries that we do. But if I could, and I'll try, um, I'm just going to show you a moment in a math lesson, the most simplest math lesson. How many ways can you represent a number? And in this lesson, um, we're going to be stepping into Allison Mercier's second grade classroom at City Neighbors. There's a lot of internal background organization to allow a classroom to work in the way this classroom's gonna work. But you'll see the children are grouped around the room. They all apparently know exactly what they're doing. Um, Miss Mercier loves music, so she's got some cool funky music going on. I want you to notice the children's thinking, and I also just want you to know how, how the feeling of this classroom is. The relaxed, the independence. And so here it is, Allison Mercier's second grade classroom. <laughs> So that kind of um, valuing the students' work and that kind of teaching, how do you empower students and how do you empower um, teachers to be in a collaborative effort with children to develop a curriculum? And I do want to mention that that includes an assessment. You cannot teach this way without being deeply rooted in assessment. And your best partners for that are students as well. What are we going to measure? Why are we going to measure it? How do we know we are learning? Um, so I just want to show you a quick minute. Um, so our, our waiting list for that first school got up so high that we decided to open two more schools. We opened City Neighbors Hamilton last year, which will be another K-8. to And this year we opened City Neighbors High School with 99th graders from across the city, 23 different middle schools all coming together for City Neighbors High School. And we're very excited about that. But again, we had to establish that strong culture. And for the high school kids, it was a little bit tough, right? Because they had been in other schools with other messages for so many years. But they're getting it. And I just want to show you um, just a minute where they're making a decision with a teacher. In this clip, the teacher is um, Tiffany Sikorsky. She's our science teacher. She's the one in the sweatshirt. And in high school, it's harder to tell the teachers and kids apart. <laughs> And she um, is presenting to them a decision about what their next project will be. Will they do it all together? Will they do separate ones? And the students um, share their thoughts on that as well. And at one point, um, one of our students, LeVar, says, you know, it could be you make pancakes, I make waffles. And it's kind of hard to hear, so I'm just letting you know. Here's okay, Tiffany's so one class. option is when we do our projects next quarter, you guys all do the same thing, but your own style. Yeah. Or we can do it the same way we did it this quarter, which is you all can do basically whatever project you want to do, as long as I know what you're doing. Do you guys have a preference about that? Yeah. What, Lexi? Why? Because I don't like the first one. 
you know, like having to do what everybody's doing. I can say the benefit to everybody doing the same thing is it's easier for me to get supplies and it's easier for me to keep track of what you're doing. But if you get different things, mm -hmm. it's more like different than like I make waffles, you make pancakes. <laughs> uh -huh. and you make pancakes. So there's more like diversity in our projects if we can do whatever we want. Okay, Jamil, you had an opinion. What do you think? Um, I think we should be the second one where we do our own so that we can learn from each other. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's true. You know, know all about that sandwich stuff. But now I do. Great. Thanks, Zach. And we are going to do Sierra's... Um... All right. <laughs> Those high school kids getting to work, right? And you heard the last um, student saying, I think we should each do our own so we can learn more about each other. So giving the um, students a say in how we do it and what we do it, really empowering them. Now, you know, many of us went to schools where the, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the school environment as well that creates this powerful feeling of a school all working together to generate itself. So um, this classroom might look familiar to you, right? It's when the teacher held all the information and the students lined up to receive that information. But now information is everywhere. People have access. Um, the hallways, they were simply pass-throughs. Um, it's the industrial model. It's a shotgun hallway with cells off of it. Um, <laughs> that sounds, the cafeteria was designed to feed a lot of people in a short amount of time, be cleaned easily. So the facility has a purpose and it was based on an industrial model of education. But if the education that I'm presenting to you, one where every single person actually does matter, where it matters if you show up, where it matters if your voice is heard, if that's what we're after, does this actually work? Um, when we went to open the high school, we decided to get more specific with our question. And we used this question, and I had the help of um, our principal of our first school, Mike Chalupa, to come up with this. What would it take to make sure that every student is known and loved and supported academically? And so we went about answering that question and making that the work of the school to answer that question. Um, so this is a pod. This is a place in the high school where 15 students and an advisor meet for an hour and a half every single day. So in this space, rather than um, lockers in the hallways, each child has a student desk, as you can see. There's a living room area. There's kind of a cool little cafe area. And in this time that they spend there together, they're doing projects. They're getting tutoring. They're doing individualized learning plans. They're being known to each other. They're creating a family within the school. Um, and then the actual environment is designed to support that. It's designed to actually um, recreate the relationship of the teacher and the students. This is a teacher and student sitting at that desk. They're both doing their work. So the pods are one of the essential ways we say, let's change up the physical environment to redefine these relationships and redefine how you spend your time at school. Um, the, what the children think, their own inspiration, all of that is important to us and we're trying to create a way to create environments that allow people to do their best work starting with the student, the vision of the student as powerful and capable in the middle of all of that. There's a comfort, isn't there? There's a, a relaxed feeling. This is Baltimore City public education. This is what it looks like, and it's lovely. <laughs> you know, I know these guys. <laughs> and, um, you know, the, I, I don't have time in this to really talk about the, the role that parents have, but I want you to know it's essential and it's um, fabulous, the gathering and collaboration of parents to help create this with our teachers and students. One of the things that we do to support that is create gathering spaces. So this is actually the lobby of the high school. Um, creating places and times for people to get together and create our school together is important to us. This used to be a brick wall. Now it's a stage, we can have movies in the park. One nice thing is the neighbor who lives right next to the school replaced his fence. You know, and I went over to introduce myself to him and he said, well, if you guys are replacing the windows and putting up that stage, I'm gonna replace my fence. And I thought, you know, there's a conversation going on with the school and the community that's very nice. So I said, come on over to the movie in the park next weekend and <laughs> join in the fun, right? So the um, cafeteria was actually designed by the students. So we took them through a process and said, if you could have the best 
cafe that you can imagine, what would it be? And they came up with needing a stage, booths, a cool leather couch area. I, I can feel that some of you are thinking about money right now. <laughs> I feel that. <laughs> I just want you to know a lot of everything you see is from hotel liquidators and office liquidators. That's why we have this cool Marriott uh, feel going on, <laughs> right? <laughs> If you can get a couch for 10 bucks, you can get six or 10 of them, right? So we do fabulous um, bargain shopping to get commercial grade furniture that's really beautiful, but, um, and it won't fall apart right away. It's all out there. We can all share and recycle and connect with others, and that's what we do. Um, the hallways are, are really important to us. So one thing we did is we made it so that student work can be easily displayed. I love this photo because one of the students took it. I just thought it was interesting the student's perspective of the art hanging in the hallways. Our idea is not just to show the finished pro product, but actually the process of people's thinking, you know, to show how they got to where they're going. And that's something that we work on all the time. We call it documentation. We put a lot of glass between the classrooms and the hallways so that this teacher can do passive supervision. She can be working with a group out here. There can be kids out in the hallway. The built-in bench, which was designed by the wonderful Aisha Isaacson, who's here in the audience tonight, is gorgeous, and at first I wanted some kind of curve in the hallway, like in the tile, and she said, babe, you can't afford it. Um, but she did put a curve for me in the bench, <laughs> and the idea is to intentionally soften the hallways, to soften what we might say to each other and how we might say it. All of this is us trying to create our school. Here's LeVar. I mean, just look at him, right? I feel like you might be able to get to know LeVar a little bit from looking at him right here. He's important to our school. This is the principal of our school, Danique Dali, with his students. They are creating City Neighbors together. And the wonderful thing is, this can be so at any school. It's just an orientation. It's a mindset saying that if we all creatively put our imaginations to work, we can design the best school we can imagine together. Here's our students coming in, right? We want them. We want the kids. They can feel that. They know that, no matter what middle school they went to and no matter what their circumstances are at home. So here's who we are. This is Baltimore City. Um, this is from our mosaic of our logo. This is our, our beautiful diversity that we have. It's powerful. We have rich people. We have poor people. We have everything in between. It's Baltimore. And this is our life, our life in school, our life together here in the city. How much can we care about each other and take care of each other and imagine for each other? And of course, my favorite part is the path. How do you get there? How, how much care can we give and how much can we know each other on our way to that beautiful place that we're all going? So this is our logo. It's City Neighbors Charter School. And I want, if you would, if you could, imagine with me the best public school system that you possibly can, then I think that we can have it here in Baltimore City. Thank you. <laughs> That was wonderful. Have any of you ever seen those books, you're probably too young, uh, where they're looking for Waldo and you go from page to page and you have to find? Well, we've been waiting for one of our speakers to show up and it dawned on us that he may be in the audience <laughs> and just hadn't checked in. So if Paul Palmiera, Palmieri is in the audience. We need you to go up to the sound booth and get mic'd up so we can bring you out on the stage. Don't be embarrassed to get up and go. We just need to begin. Now, our next speaker is Todd Marks. And I got to meet all the speakers except for Paul in <laughs> the green room. And I asked Todd, what are you going to talk about? What, what are you here to share with us? And have you ever met someone and after like the fourth word, you realize you are not nearly as smart as you think you are, <laughs> as my brain went into overload mode. Um, Todd Marks, um, through MindGrub and ViaPlace, Todd has developed some of the most cutting edge web, social, and mobile applications for Fortune 500 companies. And I asked him if he did the, the app that a friend showed me the other day, you push it and it burps. Who creates these things and why do we download them? Is, I, anyway, he had nothing to do with that. 
Um, he's written several books. He's been featured in uh, media all over the country. He's a much sought after um, conference speaker. Would you please welcome Todd Marks? Thank you. Thanks, Anthony. And if Paul, you're not here, I'll gladly speak for 36 minutes. <laughs> I do only have 18, though. And uh, fortunately for Mike, one of the best or first speaking opportunities and the best I had was Ignite Baltimore. And Ignite lets you talk for, I think it's 15 seconds a slide. Maybe it's five seconds a slide. It's really fast paced. Well, as a result, I really like to do that, too. Um, it's great that I followed Bobby. I was a high school teacher. I really believe in instant information and the best way to distribute information, whether it's hardware, software, person to person, human information. So what I wanted to do today is to impress upon everybody in here how to distribute information. And the best way to do it is to get you thinking. So my presentation today is basically to get you thinking. And I'm going back to uh, some early philosophers all the way up to really being a futurist. And I am a technologist and a futurist now. Um, my company does make mobile applications um, because that is really the best paradigm right now for distributing information based on where you are. So the quote, I think therefore I am, um, very much not my quote. Uh, so I'll try to pull in some of the other speakers too because a lot of what they said I really feel connects with my presentation as well all the way up to even speakers, uh, Carol, who's speaking this afternoon. She's a research scientist at Hopkins, computer scientist, and a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today, you'll see her getting more niche-oriented in terms of talking about artificial intelligence and computers. So this was um, Descartes, who was a mathematician and a philosopher, and he said, I think, therefore I am. And I'm gonna really extend what he talked about. So first we have to really define what is a human, or what is a person for that matter. And a person in the traditional self is a human being. Um, as Mike talked about earlier, Baltimore has a huge technology population right now. Um, you heard from Tom Loveland, who really talked about getting fiber into Baltimore to really boost what we're doing. Baltimore really is at the precipice of a great opportunity to boost technology. And as a technologist, I really want to talk about that opportunity, but also to get you thinking. So if you go to Wikipedia, it doesn't say a person is a human being. It actually extends that. It says it includes non-humans, such as animals. A lot of dog owners and cat owners would definitely tell you that they're people. Corporations, uh, back to the last election, corporations almost have more vote than we do as individuals. And even we do as, as collective individuals. Um, the fact that they can lobby and they have so much money. Uh, so is a corporation a person? Uh, they very much seem every four years that they definitely are a person. Artificial intelligence now. Again, at that precipice where artificial intelligence very well could exceed human intelligence. And that's a key thing to keep in mind. But what it really comes down to, if you're a person, is are you a citizen? Are you a, a group of beings? Um, Anthony actually started out this morning, and he talked about two twins. And one twin was having a heart murmur. And when put in the same crib as the other twin, and they bonded, um, it stopped that heart murmur. That's what it means to be a citizen, a part of a collective. That's what a republic is, as our country. And that's very important. It's about that, that communal aspect, that society. Equality. We're still fighting for equality. And you're going to hear about that a lot from other speakers today, about equality. Um, and we in Baltimore really need to focus on that as a community because we have a big divide. And we were talking earlier um, our divide is not like the divide between Brooklyn and New York where there's a bridge and a waterway. It's not like Anacostia where there's a bridge and a waterway. In Baltimore, it's a street. Um, so we need to focus on equality. And lastly, lib liberty. It's very important. For you to be a person, you have to have free will and you have to be able to express it. All right. So I am a futurist, so I'm going to talk about the future here. And I'll probably, you know, dabble a little bit and then I'll get really fast toward the end as my, my countdown starts going here. All right, so I want to kind of put it in perspective that people can kind of relate to here, but then I'm going to show you real-world examples. So there's been some great movies, uh, Minority Report being one of them, that there's some things I really liked in that movie. One of them is when Tom Cruise had taken the retinas out of uh, another guy because he needed to do a retina scan to get through a security gate. And when he was walking by the Gap, the Gap did a retinal scan, and they said, hey, Dr. Jones, it wasn't, it was Tom Cruise, and I forget his name, but we have your blue shirt. And that is when I started my company, because I thought, there's no way in heck Gap is going to have my retinal information. I'm going to store that. 
and I'm going to have it on my mobile device. And I'm going to walk by the Gap, and I'm going to query their API to get their inventory. I'm going to have personal preferences on my smartphone. This was prior to smartphones. And I'll know that they have the blue shirt that I want. The other really cool thing about Minority Report is the touch screen technology that he had. He had that big screen where he was able to throw things across and look at information. You see it on CSI every night. It's a lot of fun. Well, we don't even think about it now, but you have it in just about every smartphone today. That technology is really becoming invasive. It's everywhere. Another good movie, Star Trek. They had the holodeck. The holodeck was basically augmented reality. The difference was is it was actually in the brick and mortar. So you had a digital world based on where you are. We can get that on our smartphone. We produce augmented reality. You hold it up and you get information. Yelp, you can find out where the next restaurant is. But augmented reality will be really powerful when you actually get it immersive. When I cannot be here on this stage, but you still get what looks like a person. Simone, another good movie. Simone actually um, was about Al Pacino, who portrayed a female. She was a digital avatar, but she was overlaid in real movie. And humans actually thought she was a, a character in the movie. And he was so nervous that they would find out she wasn't actually a human, flesh and blood, um, that he really tried to be protective of her as his you know, incarnation, female incarnation. Another good one, iRobot. iRobot is a great movie because the robot there was told to stand down at one point and it actually exerts self-will and it jumps out a window. And we see this in Hollywood, they're very forward thinking, but these concepts are starting to take place now. When Carol talks, she'll probably talk about robots and being physicians unto themselves without actually having to have a human guide them. The Matrix, everybody loves The Matrix. The concepts in here are real concepts that Today, you can plug into a virtual world. You might not have a stem that goes into the back of your head, but it makes a lot of sense to go into your brain and your spinal cord, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. All right, philosophy. Let's start from the beginning. Uh, Talam, when he talked about it, he started with Socrates. I'm going to actually pick another quote from Socrates. He said, he who sees with his eyes is blind. He talked about a cave. The person in the cave, he said, was more enlightened because they're thinking in their head. But if you're out in the world, and you're socializing and boozing and concerned that you have the best Nikes on, you're not enlightened. You're looking at a physical incarnation of good ideas in the form of a tennis shoe. The good idea isn't the tennis shoe. It enables you to do something. That's a material good. And so the person in the cave who uses their brain and they think, that's where it's at. Bobby, I think she said about 10 times what she's trying to do is make students think. That really is the important thing because your brain, your mind, and your ability to think is what can power everything else. He also says the greatest happiness is of the whole. Again, looking at Baltimore, we've got a huge divide. We are one society, and that society now is a world society and hopefully one day a universal society. And so it shouldn't be about who's got the oil and who doesn't. It should be about who's got the best ideas, like Mike spoke about. He gave you a dozen ideas that were all phenomenal ideas. We should really be facilitating ideas. I do advocate fast cars moving around Baltimore Harbor. I think that's actually going to be a lot of fun. But he's right. <laughs> that long term, that's not an idea, a thought that's going to really stimulate our, our city. All right, a couple other philosophers here. And this is Tertullian. It's actually cut off, but I had to make sure I remembered that, so I, I put my little uh, clip notes down here. He said a couple of things great. He said, that which possesses an intellect is a person. So if you are intelligent, you are a person. And I'm alluding to computers here, as well as humans. And that which is defined in part by relationships. Those two takeaways, an intelligent being and one that is engaged in relationships with others. Those are the things that really define a person. All right, now moving up. And Descartes, we did say, I think, therefore I am. And I'm going to extend him. He was a, the name of the talk here. Moving ahead, we have the dawn of the information age. It really started with DARPA. Uh, the Russians launched a satellite called Sputnik. We got very concerned here in the United States that they were going to be spying on us because we don't play well with communists. Although China, we certainly work well with nowadays, although they back all of us, so it's kind of a scary thing. But <clears throat> hopefully, we'll figure it out. Um, and get kind of, you know, ease some of our debts to China. But they were really worried at the time, so they created DARPA. 
to actually start figuring out how we could make satellites. And one of the things DARPA did was figure out we need to be able to communicate readily through some sort of digital technology, really computer, computer um, communication. And so DARPA actually was the backbone of what created the internet. And so in 1983, they created protocols called TCP IP, and I don't want to bore you with the computer talk, but basically that's what gets computers talking, and everybody uses it, and that's what spawned this global communication that we have now. In 89, Sir Tim Burton's Lee, he had a proposal. His proposal was the World Wide Web. He was a philosopher. He was a thinker. But he grabbed a programmer, not unlike some of Mike's programs, and uh, both, both Mike uh, Sabelsky and Mike Brenner, who Mike Brenner did the Startup Weekend, got a bunch of people in the room together. So Tim grabbed a programmer and said, we need to make something. And they made HTTP, which is a protocol of communication that runs on TCP IP. A lot of Ps there. And then they opened it up to everybody in 1992. Um, I was just starting college at the time, and that's really one of the things that really sparked my desire to really push information and to learn. So the internets, going back, not to speak of uh, politics, I know Anthony uh, didn't actually drop uh, Bush's name, but I will. Uh, in 2004, he actually was interviewed, and he referred to the internet as the internets. Uh, from a philosophic perspective, it's really not that inaccurate. It just happened to be that we all want to be one society, so we all use the one internet and not the internets. Uh, but the funny part of this picture is who cares what you really look like? Your profile says whatever you want. And it should be based on what's in your mind. And whatever your profile is, what you do on the internet is basically a manifestation of your mind. And Socrates would say that's a bad copy. All right, convergence of technology. This is huge. This is what sparked me to uh, you know, basically quit my day job and really start working with technology. Um, you had here a hiker in the woods going from point A to point B. Here's Gordon Gecko, uh, the Wall Street. And I know, uh, you know we can't stand Wall Street nowadays, but they were some of the first users of technology. So they're proponents of something that's good. <laughs> that's, that's a cell phone there in case nobody recognizes that. <laughs> <laughs> You're not quite sure because it's really big, but uh, not a radio. I know we used to carry those on our shoulder. It is a cell phone. They're much smaller now. Uh, when the iPhone came out, I was working in New York. I've got four little girls here, and that's when I said, that's it. I quit. I'm starting a company making mobile apps. Um, and the smartphone is just one stepping stone toward having embedded computing and being able to access information and make those relationships happen, happen smarter and faster. Social media has really taken off. Facebook, number one website in the world. That's because it connects people. Google was the number one website in the world. It's a great way to retrieve information, but it's one-sided. Facebook gave that information to you from your peers, and you can just sit back and read the wall. You don't even have to search for it. That's why they're taking off so much. And it's a central community for a lot of people. If it was a country, I think it'd be the third or fourth largest in the world. All right, so mobile meets social. This is where we are now, 2011. They're really colliding here. You can tweet and retweet things. You can like it. You can share. You can check into places. And you share that with your friends, because obviously there are some privacy issues. RFID, you can get information. Actually, near-field communication is the next big step. RFIDs are a little cumbersome for a smartphone. But new smartphones, Google has one with near-field communication. So I can go out and get location based on where I am. I can get relative information. But if I'm in the grocery store, I don't know what's on every aisle, unless they were to put Wi-Fi. And I'd have to have my phone actually go from every Wi-Fi to know what aisle I was on. Near-field communication will change that, because my smartphone, which is also my smart agent, will know what aisle I'm at. And it'll be able to tell me all the prices of mac and cheese versus the fake stuff, but who eats that. The other interesting thing here, too, is if I'm in a store and a salesman's telling me this is the best radio in the world and he's got a commission, well, he's tainted. That's not a good idea. But if I can hold my phone up and actually see the number of Facebook lights floating in augmented reality over a particular radio, I know that's probably the best one to buy. And that's where we're going. So with information going this fast, we need to look at what is a human. This is a little unsettling, but most people think a human is a body and a mind. Well, this is actually pretty interesting. Last week in China, um, a, a pair of co-joined twins were born. And they have uh, two brains, two spinal cords, and they share everything else alike. Um, in 1996, Life did a piece on the Hensel twins, uh, who are older now and actually thriving. Um, a lot of co-joined 
pairs have a lot of heart problems and stuff because, you know, obviously heart brings blood to your brain um, and you need as much of it as you can get there as possible. With co-joined twins, a lot of times, most of the time, they, they end up with two brains. And surprisingly, each one operates one half of the body, but they learn to work together as quickly as a single individual would be able to work. They drive a car, they type together. Two separate brains, but they work together in one body. The important thing to get out of this is that the mind is not tied to a single body. And that's where we are in time right now, is that our mind is now going outside of our body. It's going into the internets and working with our friends there. We also, for Parkinson's uh, patients, we can put a, um, a pacemaker in the heart that runs and, and puts a signal in the brain. And that'll actually uh, deter Parkinson's disease, which is a, a degenerative disease for the body. But the interesting thing is this is an enhanced human. I remember in one of the Olympics, uh, somebody, an amputee, had a, a fake leg, and they were actually able to run faster than somebody with two human legs. Uh, so it's very interesting, the times that we're going in. Um, it's no longer just the physical body. It's now really your mind and what you can plug it into. There's virtual worlds now with Second Life. Um, so now, no longer do you have to be contained in this physical world. You can go into this virtual world and flourish in that virtual world. There are university classes. You can learn about physics much easier than potentially in the real world. All right, artificial intelligence. This is really taking off now. IBM with Deep Blue beat the best chess player in the world in uh, 97. A couple months ago, they beat the best Jeopardy player. These are computers. So we can't say, and everybody knows Jeopardy is, oh, you've got a lot of useless knowledge. And it's funny they preface with useless. Because really, it's not your knowledge. It's, it's your ability to think. Because now with the internet, you can tap into the knowledge as long as you know how to use it. And that's the key thing. Alan Turney proposed the Turing test, which what that is is a test to determine when computers exceed our intelligence. It's important. We're going to pass it pretty soon. They almost passed in 2008 if one more judge thought that that computer was an actual person on the other end. They, they chat back and forth to, to have banter and figure out if they're an actual human or not. So we know data from Star Trek, and, and I alluded to Star Trek before. Um, data was a computer, 100% computer, and he was constantly trying to figure out where the line is between man and machine. They had him cry, they had him fall in love, but yet we didn't think Data was a person, right? Ah, he's a machine. I know they're having tears coming down his face, and I know he fell in love, but he's just a machine. But these concepts are not unique to this body. It might be unique to your brain or your mind. And when computers exceed our intelligence, will it be unique to us, or might you also have that capability within machines? All right, robotics. It's coming along here. DARPA, once again, they now have computers or machines that can walk on our four legs. There's now robots that can play ping pong. That looks a lot like the iRobot uh, in the movie, an awful lot like, and he's even got cool shades. <laughs> Human-computer interaction, this is really coming along too. An original TED Talk, touchscreen, now on your device. We can now control pinball machines with our mind. Uh, JFIS here in Baltimore has augmented reality goggles. They don't quite look like Oakley's, but the power is getting there. Another local company, Zephyr, has a bioharness that'll tell you all your biometrics. And ultimately, life casting Gordon Bell try to capture all that world and, and put it into the internet to try to get uh, ongoing life. And ultimately today, the Morgan Zana spillway is flooding thousands of homes to try to save many. And one of the best things that's said here is uh, when uh, Bill Regala was heading out, he said he needs to get backups for his computer and get our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament. Those are the primary things. And he said, if we get flooded, we can still write checks and get things going again. That's very important. So singularity, and I'm out of time, so I'll wrap up here, but singularity is a concept of when man and machine come together and there's no distinction between them. It's actually a linear graph towards singularity, and it's happening. Kurzweil thinks it's 2049. That's when I think computers will become self-aware, not necessarily when we combine with them. And what does the future hold? It holds cooler glasses for augmented reality, more human enhancements, smart agents that'll tell you what to do next based on your preferences. It's going to have persons are going to be either natural born or humans. There's a great movie called Ghost in the Shell. You should see it, an anime movie, where they say anybody's human who has some human brain cells in their brain. But other than that, you can be entirely mechanical. And lastly, we'll just have to define what is a human. 
The takeaway today for you is for you to use your brain and to think because that's the one vestige of intelligence that we have moving forward. And whether we leverage computers or computers might exceed us, we need to hold on to that ability to think because right now we're the leaders in it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did I hear some of, one of the speakers mention an amateur porn festival as an idea? I think he's on to something. Guess who I just met? Paul Palmieri. <laughs> Paul Palmieri is president and CEO of Millennium Media. He's a well-known pioneer and industry leader in the global mobile entertainment and data marketplace. He is called and has been referred to by um, Wireless Week, the content guru. So let's welcome Paul Palmieri. Paul. Thank you very much. All right, well uh, again, my name is Paul Palmieri. I'm the co-founder, president, and CEO of Millennial Media. Millennial Media is about a five-year-old company, about 140 employees, and we're in the business of advertising on mobile phones. In the mobile advertising market around display advertising, Google, Apple, and Millennial combined have 54% share uh, of that market. But I want to talk to you today a little bit about work and a little bit about what I've learned and how I've learned the importance of enjoying one's work. And so, uh, if you'll indulge me, I've got a little bit of uh, uh, roll back to how I got into being an entrepreneur and how I've been influenced uh, uh, and learned about enjoying one's work. So as far back as I can remember, both of my parents really enjoyed their jobs. I didn't really know any different. I just thought that everybody really enjoyed their jobs. As a matter of fact, at the dinner table every night, it would become a replay of the day. My mother, in particular, was like a one-woman show, and it kind of went like this. And little Billy said this, and the principal said that. And uh, it was just amazing to see the passion uh, with which uh, my parents uh, worked. My mother also had three key sayings that she would always say to us when we were kids. And now, of these three sayings, I kind of thought they were all parables, some things that come from her background, her Irish tradition passed down uh, from, uh, from the 1600s, and indeed two of them were. Uh, a good example of that is where there's a will, there's a way. And according to the kind of cultural dictionary, uh, it says back to the 1600s. But one of them was her very own, and it goes like this. Enjoy what you're doing while you are doing it, which is pretty amazing. The say, uh, this saying has deeply influenced how I operate, and every day I find new nuances of it. And there's really three parts to it. One, enjoy what you're doing. Drink it in. Uh, whether it's work, whether it's play, drink life in. The second, while you are doing it. Don't later say, oh, that was really great or I did really enjoy that, be in the moment. And the last one is, you have these moments that are unique and that you may never again experience exactly what you're experiencing at this very moment, and so be in that moment. My kids who are sitting up here will tell you that I say this saying all the time, uh, and maybe they thought it came from me, but, but now they know. But it doesn't really stop there uh, with how that impacts life. Understanding and internalizing this wisdom while applying it to work has led to substantial success to me, and I probably have only recently realized how powerful it has been for me uh, in my career. But it didn't all come from mom, and I learned every day from so many people. I want to share with you some of the stories of the people who've impacted this understanding and uh, uh, convinced me that enjoying what you do really does have tangible impact on success. After graduating college, I was selling college rings. And not content with that uh, career choice, 
I looked up a fellow alum who was 12 years my senior, Tom Looney. Tom at the time was running sales for Next Computer, and I sat down with him and had lunch at a Thai place, and I asked him for career advice. And Tom said, I'm not really sure what I can tell you, but I do know that being in the technology business is incredibly fun. So I thought, interesting lunch. And then he goes on to say something that I really remember, which is that if you want to enjoy what you're doing, look for a growth industry. Because growth industries are full of optimistic people passionate about what it is that they do. And so he said, if you go into one of these, you're virtually guaranteed to enjoy it and have success. And he said at the time, technology was one of those industries and that the wireless industry in particular would be one soon. Isaac Babs runs Qualcomm Services Labs in Silicon Valley. Isaac has been a longtime advisor to me and a successful executive, president, and entrepreneur at companies like Shockwave, Macromedia, Glue Mobile, and Atlas Mobile. And Isaac, when I was contemplating whether to become an entrepreneur, I asked Isaac to have a dinner with me and to teach me everything he knew, of course, in, in one hour. And uh, he kind of gave me the basics, but to this day, he's an advisor to me, and every time I talk to him, guess what he says? He says, are you still having fun? And then he goes through each member of my team that he knows, and he says, is this one having fun? Is this one enjoying what they're doing and how? So because he knows the criticality of this in terms of achievement and success. Andrew Knox is a 26-year-old Baltimore native. As a single guy working in the hospitality industry, he enjoys both the work he gets paid for and the work that he does not. My son and I met Andrew at Cub Scout camp a few years ago when Andrew was taking 10 at-risk inner city kids out for their first experience in the woods. Many of them, it was the first time they were in a pool, and many of them was the first time they ever saw a rowboat, let alone rode one. I continue to be inspired by his passion, and I, I run into him from time to time in Baltimore, and uh, he's somebody that's influenced me as well as somebody who's really enjoying what he's doing. Alan McIntosh is a mentor and advisor for me, and somebody who has spent an incredible amount of time and has been incredibly giving with his time in terms of helping me out. As I was making the transition from big company to entrepreneur, I didn't really know that I wanted to do it. And Alan started with me and said, look, what's right, what seems right, is probably right. And then he and some others took me on a week trip to Lillehammer, Lillehammer, Norway, in a small cabin with the goal of the week to determine whether, I would, whether entrepreneurship was right for me. And it was there that I made my choice of what to do next. Alan, uh, today, continues to be an advisor and board member at Millennial, and he often asks me how we are driving enjoyment by celebrating tangibly achievement and success. And so he's constantly thinking, gosh, how are you rewarding your team? How are you enjoying your success? Steve Root is a business partner, a friend, and the COO at Millennial Media. He's an incredible leader of people. What Steve does, though, every day that is amazing is he forces people to step back and think about how enjoyable our experience is as we go. Chris Brandenburg is a business partner, my co-founder, and a friend as well. And Chris is an example of someone who is childlike with their work. As a matter of fact, Chris would probably tell you that this is his office, uh, like a kid in a candy store. Chris personifies the saying, if you do something that you love, you will never work another day in your life. Steve and Chris are applying the principles that I believe in about enjoying one's work as we go through our experience uh, uh, at Millennial. 
It's been amazing. And even through growing pains, tough times, disagreements, we always are having a great, uh, great experience together and enjoying each other, regardless of how tough the issue is of the day. So I've learned a lot of things about the enjoyment of work. So here are some of the key points. One, if you enjoy what you're doing while you're doing it, that is a killer philosophy to adopt. Second, enjoying your work uniformly translates into success, no matter what the job is that you're doing. Third, enjoying your work can deliver peace of mind for you at home as well. Someone who's happy in their job is going to be happy at home, and that's just, I think, an amazing gift to give to your family. The next one is, hey, take stock. Take stock. Take a deep breath. Step back and enjoy uh, what you're doing. Many times, the most enjoyable thing is the people that you work with. The next one is, people notice when you enjoy your work. They notice. You meet somebody new for the first time in any kind of a business or personal setting, there is a wall up. And it's that moment when you cross through that wall that the relationship becomes productive for business, that the friendship becomes codependent. It's like the shell of an M&M. You show people that you enjoy your work, there'll be no candy coating. You'll walk right in and you'll get right to the chocolate. The next one is make sure the people you surround yourself are enjoying what they're doing as well as they, and by extension, you, will be more successful. Obviously, growth industries, I think Tom Looney was right. Growth industries are full of people who are optimistic and enjoying their work. And the last thing, which I'm going to spend a bit of time on here, is that um, if you're starting a company, one way where you can get an advantage over your competitors is make sure everybody in your company is having a great time and is, uh, and is enjoying their work. At Millennial, we have these core values, and the extent to which employees display these core values, there's incentive cash compensation uh, at the end of the year. I'm not going to go into each one of them, but integrity is one, and how we describe integrity is, uh, is we say we're virtuous people, and we're the people you'd like to go to lunch with. And that's one of the things that we measure when people come in and interview is, is this someone we'd like to go to lunch with? Which leads us to the second way uh, we do this uh, at Millennial, which is at company meetings, we tell our employees, hey, when you interview somebody, be tough. Let's only let in the people who are going to love what they do. The third thing we do is we extensively use team offsites and reward and retreat meetings to stay aligned while learning how to enjoy each other informally. We also celebrate success and achievement, which I'll talk about in a minute, but we also connect with the community through the charitable work that we can do as a team. And we celebrate success, and whether that's omelets in the kitchen with an omelet cook uh, you know, for 100 people to, to celebrate a product launch, or whether it's a trip for the entire company to the, to the baseball game, or whether it's uh, flying spouses in, uh, to our holiday party, uh, we are uh, committed uh, to this path. So that's kind of what I learned and, uh, and how I'm applying the enjoyment of work to what we do at Millennial Media. And so I'll leave you with, with, uh, with this question. Over the next 20 years, what percentage of your time will you be spending working? Now, if you're like me and you're sort of geeky about it, you're, you're going to go and figure out the number, but I can tell you the number, and I don't really want to you know, bring the crowd down with what that number is, but let's just say it's more than 50% and you can discount it down to 50%. If you're going to be spending 50% of your time working, when are you going to have that moment where you go out and think about, like I did in this cabin in Norway, what's right for you, and who are those people in your business or your life who are going to talk to you about what the path might be for those options. 
And so uh, what I would say is, wow, like a kid in a candy store, right? So make work the best it can be, and you will be the best you can be. Thank you. Great job, Paul. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michelle. Now, Michelle is a wife, mother, and sought-after comedian whose appearances include Nickelodeon's Search for the Funniest Mom in America. She's hilarious. You're going to love this. Now, she is an Open Society Institute community fellow. She's created a program called Gold Diggers. Not, not Gold Diggers, but Gold Diggers, the Sankofa Project. And it includes 15 African-American girls from Baltimore City. Um, and they are taught to study their ancestry, heritage, and lineage utilizing anthropology, technology, and DNA testing. And at the end of the program, they take all 15 girls to Ghana and West Africa. And it is an incredible program. She's an incredible comedian. I've had some rough times in my life. It's not always been rosy and cheery like I appear today. And every time I'm going through something, I can always count on a phone call from this comedian, Michelle, who touches my heart. You're going to enjoy it. Michelle, welcome. Thank you. And so the first thing you're thinking is, who is this cute woman? I know you're thinking that. With the red hair, who does that? I am so excited about being here today at TED, and I know I don't have a lot of time, but I do have to say this. When I first met Ted, I knew that he was a white man. That's what the first thing. <laughs> and then I thought maybe that he had some transformation and he had become a Muslim, thus TEDx. But if you don't get that, <laughs> we don't have a lot of time, so you got to go home and Google some stuff to catch up later. <laughs> Or for those of you who are hard up, you probably got your, your iPad out right now, you're Googling, why is that funny, TEDx? But <laughs> again, um, you know, I'm known as Michelle, and, and on the comedy arena, I'm Michelle, the indie mom of comedy. And I just want to tell you what that is real quick so you can have a better backdrop about me. I'm a wife and a mother. I've been married 12 years this year. And I have three small children, nine, seven, and four. I happen to be married to another one of the TEDx talkers tonight. You'll see him later in the half hour. He is Lamar Darnell Shields. I call him the um, broke Denzel Washington. He is amazing. <laughs> broke in the sense that we don't have the same bank account, but very rich in intellect and very attractive with beautiful teeth. And so. <laughs> So it all works out. He happens, um, I, I, would, I would take too long talking about him. He would take up too many of my minutes, and I'll see him after the show. So um, I don't need to talk about him too much. But I do want to say this. An indie mom is a woman who believes that it's OK and great to be a mom, and it's awesome to be a wife. But you've got to hold on to yourself as well. You've got to have some balance in your life. You, and, and my mantra is, in order to be a good indie mom, you still have to be innovative and independent in a lot of ways. And, what has helped me stay innovative is leaving a PhD program and becoming a stand-up comic. That was a very innovative idea. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out whether it was a good choice, but I think some of my resume would suggest that I've made some good decisions throughout this course of time. But I'll tell you what's been most innovative about being an indie mom. I've created this concept that if you do what you love and you live your dream, you're a happier mom and you're a better wife. I also have this mantra that you should always look like the girlfriend. <laughs> now, some of you won't get that because you've given up on that a long time ago. I have, my intention is to look like the girlfriend. You all know history predicts if you look like the girlfriend, you get to leave the house. If you look like the mom, you're home making grilled cheese. That's your issue. So my intention is to keep it tight in the waist and cute in the face. I do whatever it takes to make that happen. I got all the right equipment, I got a Spanx, I got a girdle, I got a whole bunch of stuff that holds stuff together after having babies back to back for the last few years. And so another point of being very innovative was also celebrating what's made me this indie person, a person, a person who just likes to keep things very, very new and fresh. And so one of the things that's made me an indie mom and, 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 and now an OSI fellow is that I celebrate the two Baltimores that I grew up in. 
I grew up in two Baltimores. I grew up in West Baltimore. And when I say West Baltimore, you know, there's, there's a couple of kind of West Baltimores we can talk about. But for those of you all who are not clear, I, I, I grew up on the side of Baltimore. You have Israel and then you have Beirut. I grew up in Beirut. <laughs> I don't have time to explain why that should be funny. Y'all need to go home and do some research. But the, at the end of the day, the Beirut I grew up in was a working class Beirut where everyone had a job. The moms and dads all lived in the house with you. I grew up right in West Baltimore. We were in an extended family. We lived with both my grandparents, my aunts, my uncles, my mom. And so the West Baltimore I grew up in in the 70s was a very family friendly, friendly working class Baltimore, right? These are people who went to work every day. Um, and then my mother had the bright idea to move me to the Northwest suburbs. She thought it would be like the Jefferson show, moving on up. And so we, um, I don't have time to explain why that should be funny, but <laughs> y'all are not as smart as they make you all out to be. That's what you need to understand. I'm a little disappointed in all of you at this point. But she did this whole experiment of marrying my stepdad and he moved us out to the northwest suburbs. And at the time, the northwest suburbs was just a, a nice little area where all of um, my friends who were Jewish had moved to the northwest suburbs because I found out that's the only place you could go. And so they moved you out there and it was all of you and then some, and some Gentiles and a couple of us. It was just two of us on my block. And when we showed up, it, 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 I don't know what happened. Everybody opened their window and they just started looking outside like... I think we got one, I think we got one. And, uh, <laughs> yep, yep, mom and dad, two of them. We got a family of four. We're gonna ride this out, see what happens. We're gonna ride this out. Because <laughs> everybody was banking, we weren't gonna make it out there. And <laughs> this is before development. So we lived across from a patch of woods in a small area, and they called it the Lost World. And we were told never to go over there because there was a whole bunch of yeehaw and there were no horses. And so we knew, <laughs> real slow on this side, we knew. <laughs> Not to go where the yeehaw was going, okay? But the beautiful part about growing up in this dichotomous um, northwest suburb was that I had the awesome opportunity to meet people who didn't look like me and actually step into their worlds for a moment. And two of my best friends were twins who were Jewish and they would go to Sunday school and Hebrew school and they would teach me Yiddish words and they would always teach me the words that were the dirty words, right? <laughs> because you have to know the dirty Yiddish words, you have to. And so they said, if ever somebody says this to you, then you should say that. And so I felt obligated to teach them something that they didn't know, double Dutch. <laughs> You know and I know that these two little Jewish girls did not know how to double Dutch, and neither did my white friend, Beth. Beth didn't know how to double Dutch either. And so my endeavor as a, as a part of reciprocity was to teach them something they didn't know. And I got a little bit over my head because I didn't factor in the whole lack of rhythm thing. It was real. <laughs> little tricky, little tricky, little tricky. But what it introduced me to was how Beautiful it was to have a connection to your ancestry, your heritage, and your lineage. And how having that connection gave you something that oftentimes being a little girl of color from Baltimore never gave you. All I used to get about being a little girl, a, a girl of color from Baltimore was that your folks came from down south. Now down south is not a country. <laughs> It isn't, but it has its own culture, it has its mores, it has its norms, you know, it has its own cuisine, but it is certainly not a country. And, and that I felt like I was missing something the entire time because my Jewish friends used to go to Israel for the summer. They would go and they would visit their booby, right? And they would come back, Hava Nagila. I had none of that, I had none of that. All I had was like Rick James and like James Brown and I couldn't really... <laughs> And James Brown had me conflicted because he looked like a man, but his hair was shiny, and I just couldn't, I couldn't reconcile the two. And so I said, I need something deeper. I need something more. And I didn't even realize I needed something deeper and something more until I kept learning about my other friends. I had some good friends who were Italian. They let you know they were Italian. They let you know they would, their grandmother was from Sicily and she used to make pasta by hand. And I thought pasta came in a box. I didn't know that it was by hand that you made this stuff. And so they would teach me these things. It would give them license to do stuff. Having an ancestry and a heritage and a lineage connects you to something greater than yourself. When the rest of the world suggests to you that you're just the ancestor of a slave. I needed something. I wanted something, I longed for something. I think that's why I used comedy. Even before I knew it, I was told I was funny as a kid. The laughter was my panacea for the pain. The pain of never really knowing where did my ancestors come from? 
And why are they the most hated but the most imitated people in the world? I said, somebody has got to help me out. And then came Roots, and I thought I was on to something, but Chicken George made me so mad. <laughs> I was like, why is his name Chicken, and why is he George? Like, can we pick a lane and stay in it? I love Kunta Kente, because he was like, look, I ain't giving Kunta, that's it. But it still wasn't enough because even though Alex Haley did a phenomenal job educating me about our life before here in the States, I didn't have enough reinforcement in my school. I was told Nat Turner was a horrible man. If you do the research, this guy was a revolutionary. Whether you liked him or not, he believed in something and he went for it. He's no different than any other great martyr that we look to. He just happened to have the wrong color skin. And so I said to myself, how can I find out more about me? And the funny thing happened, I started having babies. <laughs> Some of y'all still don't see the connection. I don't have a lot of time. <laughs> That's a whole nother show, a whole nother day. But your children will give you license to want to be better, to want to know more. Your children will urge you to say, well, not only where did I come from, but where did I come from? Like, where did I come from? And so my kids, you know, who are very, you know, innovative people themselves, I have one who I was grossly afraid that she would end up somewhere nude because she loved being naked. I know everybody has that one child that just loves being naked. She was free in her nakedness. She would just stand there naked and go, Mommy, this! And being a quasi-intellectual, I needed to know, was that, genetically predis was that a genetically predisposed attitude? Did she come from a tribe of naked people who enjoyed being naked? <laughs> and saw no fault in the nakedness? Saw the beauty of the nakedness? Or was she going to end up on a pole at some point? That was my biggest fear. <laughs> and then we had this boy. We had this one daughter, the first daughter, she comes, she comes out at home. We had three natural births with a midwife. I could tell you that all day. And I know I had to be somewhere along the line, I kept believing there's some reason why birthing is fun to me. Somewhere in my ancestry, there's somebody who could have babies just, and I just squatted and had them, like straight up old school. I just squatted. <laughs> I know some of you all want to be my friend now. I don't have time for that. <laughs> Listen. Because <laughs> you think I'm super, you think I'm awesome. But, but I had these three babies, and the last one, the boy, nobody warned me. Nobody warned me how different these people are, not even my husband. <laughs> nobody warned me that the minute you take off his diaper, <laughs> nobody warned me. I'm thinking I have birthed Hugh Hefner and Brown. Yes, I have. <laughs> All of this caused me to want to know more about who and whose I am and where is the connection because you all know that you can, how many of you all in here know that you are Italian? Raise your hand if you're Italian. Raise your hand if you're, we got one Italian. Hey, what's up, baby? Me and you. Me and you all night. We're going to ride it out. Any Irish folks of Irish descent here? The Blarney Stone. We're going to kiss the Blarney Stone. I shouldn't even know that stuff is what I'm saying to you. How many folks are, are Scottish or English or Welsh or it, maybe it's the same thing? I don't know. I don't even care. <laughs> how many of our beautiful European folks, I mean, how many folks are of Jewish heritage? You're, you're a, a Jewish person or a Jewish American. You right here. I knew that. Shalom. I knew that. <laughs> I would like to say something like, holla at me later, but I don't really have time. <laughs> that was brilliant. I don't really, you know. Anyway, so... <laughs> Holla. No, okay, anyway. And so all of these things helped me to trust the process. Trust the process that I'm on this journey to really learn more about who and whose I am beyond the United States, beyond West Baltimore, beyond what I've been told. And so I had this audacious idea to create something based on my first introduction to the study of African American history. I went to a little historically black college called Bowie State University down in Maryland. Yes, thank you for clapping, white woman. You're awesome, because you... <laughs> the rest of these folks are like, what? <laughs> One of the oldest historically black colleges and universities in the country. And um, I went there, and I had this amazing professor, and he introduced me to the study of African-American history and African history. And I started learning about all these amazing things that my ancestors, yes, my ancestors, actually created, like the first library. Yes, Timbuktu was not in Europe. I know you're blown, aren't you? You're blown away by that. <laughs> I was told about how some of the most amazing things came out of the continent that's loathed and loved at the same time. 
And it urged me to want to know more, to want to be able to tell to my daughters, you know why? You walk with that little limp, your great, 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 great grandmother had that limp. And she was from Ghana, from a small village called Asankrangwa. But I can't tell her that just yet. And so my intention was to be deliberate and not just give it to me, but give it to other girls from my community and then give it to every girl that shares African heritage around the country. Is it a big idea? Of course it's a big idea, but I'll tell you why it's relevant. Because even though you say we're all in a melting pot, have you noticed that some of the, some of the things in the melting pot continue to rise to the top? <laughs> and some of the things in the melting pot stay at the bottom? And I'll be the first to tell you that I've been at the bottom and it sucks and I'm ready to float to the top. Right. And everybody that looks like me that shares my ancestry should be just as joyous, just as excited. Why will it make a difference? Because when you know who you are and where you come from, when the rest of the world punches you in the throat and says you're just the ancestor of a slave, you can always say that's not so. I can tell you exactly where my folks come from, what we were known for in our country, what was our biggest attribute, our moral sense, the way that we looked at things, the language we spoke, the way we prepared our food, how we were always this way. And I, I can give you more when you try to knock me down, I can stand back up. And I can use that stance to take advantage of what this country does offer me, which is education. And I can be educationally excellent. And then from my excellence, I can pursue every goal I've ever dreamt of. And from pursuing that goal, then I become a leader. And then when I become a leader, I give back to everybody that looks like me and that doesn't look like me until we're really a melting pot, a real melting pot. And so I decided that I would go right back to Park Heights where I came from. I would go right back to West Baltimore because now the biggest epidemic in West Baltimore is a chicken box. <laughs> now some of y'all don't know what that is. And you shouldn't. But it's literally a box of chicken. It's not that deep. It's a little red and white checkered box of chicken and inside are pieces of a chicken and the chicken has been fried, dyed and laid to the side and it's been covered in hot sauce and, and I don't know what else, I don't know how old the grease is, I don't know if the chicken is dead or alive because sometimes it's still moving, I'm not real sure what a chicken box is but it has captured the lives of girls and boys that look like me and we eat that day in and day out. And I promise you, I want to share them. I want to share with them, listen, you're bigger than a chicken box. You have so much more to go for than a chicken box. How about we go and we, you, you, you try some fufu? How about I take you and you try some, some of the best dishes in the world? Can I, can I teach you about some hummus and some pita bread? Can I introduce you to some tabbouleh or some couscous? Can I take your palate somewhere where your mind won't take you just yet, but can I take your palate? So I created Goal Diggers, G-O-A-L-D-I-G-G-E-R-S, the Sankofa Project, Birthright Africa. And I said, I'm gonna introduce girls that look like me from my neighborhood. I'm gonna deliver them from the chicken box. That's one thing, <laughs> right? And then I'm gonna deliver their minds from complacency. I'm gonna deliver their hearts, hopefully, from thinking that all you're ever going to be is all you're ever going to be is all you're ever going to be. And I'm gonna introduce you to yourself using anthropology. I'm gonna pop you into communities and I want you to see, it's not just us that are crazy. I've met other crazy people that don't look like us. <laughs> One little boy I met that went to the country school with my daughter was very crazy. I wish I had time to tell you about him, but the boy had no cooth. I don't know where he came from. He thought everything was funny. His name was Finnegan. I changed his name and just in case y'all know Finnegan, I'm not talking about him. Finnegan had no boundaries. He would just say stupid stuff. Be like, hey, Miss Johnson, my booty itches. This boy was four. <laughs> so anthropologically speaking, I wanted to pop you into his world and see what makes him tick. So we're going to use anthropology, technology. I'm not, a tech, I'm not a technologist. I didn't even know the word existed until I met Todd. And I'm relatively intelligent, but I don't care. But I'm going to introduce them to technology. I'm going to introduce them to searching their ancestry using the internet and then DNA testing, forensic science. We're going to let you know exactly where you came from. And at the end of this all, you'll be more than just a girl from Baltimore, more than just a girl from Park Heights. You'll be more than just a girl. Maybe I wear this red hair because I'm genetically predisposed from my village, the women of red hair who slap people who are obnoxious. Maybe that's who I really am. <laughs> and this is Gold Diggers. The Sankofa Project, Birthright Africa, and I am Michelle, the indie mom of comedy. Thank you so much. So, 
So we are now at the conclusion of session one. Let's give all of our wonderful speakers a hand. They are inspiring. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to watch a video, a TED video, that's going to give you some more insight into this experience. Because uh, TED has taught us, and this incredible experience has taught us, people go back into their homes, they go back into their communities, and they begin, if they're not already, and I know many of you are, they really do begin to make a difference. Even if it's just in the life of those in their circle, they really do start making a difference. So watch this video, and I'll be back in just a moment. I grew up to study the brain because I have a brother who has been diagnosed with a brain disorder, schizophrenia. And as a sister and later as a scientist, I wanted to understand why is it that I can take my dreams, I can connect them to my reality, and I can make my dreams come true. What is it about my brother's brain and his schizophrenia that he cannot connect his dreams to a common and shared reality, so they instead become delusion? So I dedicated my career to research into the severe mental illnesses, and I moved from my home state of Indiana to Boston, where I was working in the lab of Dr. Francine Bennis in the Harvard Department of Psychiatry. And in the lab, we were asking the question, what are the biological differences between the brains of individuals who would be diagnosed as normal control as compared with the brains of individuals diagnosed with schizophrenia, schizoaffective, or bipolar disorder? So we were essentially mapping the microcircuitry of the brain, which cells are communicating with which cells, with which chemicals, and then in what quantities of those chemicals. So there was a lot of meaning in my life because I was performing this type of research during the day. But then in the evenings and, and on the weekends, I traveled as an advocate for NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. But on the morning of December 10, 1996, I woke up to discover that I had a brain disorder of my own. A blood vessel exploded in the left half of my brain. And in the course of four hours, I watched my brain completely deteriorate in its ability to process all information. On the morning of the hemorrhage, I could not walk, talk, read, write, or recall any of my life. I essentially became an infant in a woman's body. If you've ever seen a human brain, it's obvious that the two hemispheres are completely separate from one another. And I have brought for you a real human brain. <laughs> Thank you. So this is a real human brain. This is the front of the brain the back of the brain with the spinal cord hanging down. And this is how it would be positioned inside of my head. And when you look at the brain, it's obvious that the two cerebral cortices are completely separate from one another. For those of you who understand computers, our right hemisphere functions like a parallel processor, while our left hemisphere functions like a serial processor. The two hemispheres do communicate with one another through the corpus callosum, which is made up of some 300 million axonal fibers. But other than that, the two hemispheres are completely separate. Because they process information differently, each of our hemispheres think about different things, they care about different things, and dare I say, they have very different personalities. Excuse me. Thank you. It's been a joy. <laughs> Our right human hemisphere is all about this present moment. It's all about right here, right now. Our right hemisphere, it thinks in pictures, and it learns kinesthetically through the movement of our bodies. 
Information in the form of energy streams in simultaneously through all of our sensory systems, and then it explodes into this enormous collage of what this present moment looks like, what this pro present moment smells like and tastes like, what it feels like, and what it sounds like. I am an energy being connected to the energy all around me through the consciousness of my right hemisphere. We are energy beings connected to one another through the consciousness of our right hemispheres as one human family. And right here, right now, we are brothers and sisters on this planet here to make the world a better place. And in this moment, we are perfect, we are whole, and we are beautiful. My left hemisphere, our left hemisphere, is a very different place. Our left hemisphere thinks linearly and methodically. Our left hemisphere is all about the past, and it's all about the future. Our left hemisphere is designed to take that enormous collage of the present moment and start picking out details, details, and more details about those details. It then categorizes and organizes all that information associates it with everything in the past we've ever learned, and projects into the future all of our possibilities. And our left hemisphere thinks in language. It's that ongoing brain chatter that connects me and my internal world to my external world. It's that little voice that says to me, hey, you got to remember to pick up bananas on your way home. I need them in the morning. It's that calculating intelligence that knows, that reminds me when I have to do my laundry. But perhaps most important, it's that little voice that says to me, I am. I am. And as soon as my left hemisphere says to me, I am, I become separate. I become a single, solid individual, separate from the energy flow around me and separate from you. And this is a portion of my brain that I lost on the morning of my stroke. On the morning of the stroke, I woke up to a pounding pain behind my left eye. And it was the kind of pain, caustic pain, that you get when you bite into ice cream. And it just gripped me. And then it released me. And then it just gripped me. And then it released me. And it was very unusual for me to ever experience any kind of, of pain, so I thought, okay, I'll just start my normal routine. So I got up and I jumped onto my Cardia Glider, which is a full body, full exercise machine. And I'm jamming away on this thing, and I'm realizing that my hands look like primitive claws grasping. and my head is getting worse, so I get off the machine, and I'm walking across my living room floor, and I 